Hello, my name is Karen Ainsley. I am the public library consultant here at the Indiana State Library. Many of you probably know me for the, from the Library Development Office. I also work with um, Central Indiana in the Professional Development Office. So thank you for join us, joining us for today's webinar. We're pleased to have Kate Kunk, SACOA Caregiver Options Counselor, with us today to speak about services for caregivers in the sandwich. For those of you who got on earlier, I had a presentation that was uh, uh, rotating through the various screens where you can find out information about our other webinar continuing education webinars and that you can register through the library events calendar which can be found on our website at library.in.gov. And there you can find a full list of our current in-person training menu as well. We have many ways we try to stay connected with you. So for weekly updates and upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state, please subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter, The Wednesday Word. We also offer a blog which provides information about the Indiana State Collection and has different interviews in there and other notable um, items of interest. If at any point during the webinar you experience any technical issues, please enter your issue into the chat box. Today's webinar will be archived and available to access and share on the Professional Development Office's Learning Management System. And you'll receive a link to that webinar with your LEU. And as we said, we try to get those LEUs out to you within 30 days. So without further ado, I welcome Kate Kunk. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm very interested in speaking about services for caregivers in the sandwich, and specifically about access to the Hoosier supports for them. <clears throat> Um, as Karen said, my name is Kate Kunk. I'm a registered nurse and a caregiver options counselor with SOCOA, which is known as an area agency on aging in Indiana. Um, my specific function is non-medical in nature, and, uh, but I am an RN and that comes in handy from time to time. So let's just introduce you. We need to talk about who you are because uh, you obviously uh, are listening to this webinar for your own specific reasons, but I wonder if you also recognize the value of this information to you uh, as you wear other hats. Uh, most of us have family members, we have friends, neighbors, people sitting down in the pew from us in a faith community or a club. Um, maybe you got here by mistake somehow, you thought this was some other webinar, I don't know. But in any case, uh, you know that you're wearing a lot of different hats today, and I would like you to put all of them on, um, not only as an employee for the library, but also uh, for yourself, because there will be a time when you may be a caregiver, and perhaps that would be you even today. So some of the things we're going to talk about today include what an area agency on aging is and how it functions to make lives better. How can caregivers, elderly people, and people with a disability access the services of the area agency on aging? Why do the area agencies on aging matter to everybody? And what are some other community resources in Indiana for caregivers and elderly people and people with a disability? And finally, what can you do? So just first to define an area agency on aging, um, in 1965, Congress passed the Older Americans Act. I have no idea what uh, that piece of legislation did, uh, except that it mandated that every person in the country would have an agency like mine. Um, I was a teenager in 1965, and so I uh, really wasn't paying too much attention. But uh, when I came to work for SOCOA, I realized, um, you know, what, what these agencies do. So we're going to just talk a little bit about what they do, who they're for, and how can we find yours. Um, today, I'm speaking to you as a representative of the central 
uh, piece of Indiana, that would be Marion County and the seven surrounding counties. Um, however, if you are elsewhere, you too have an area agency on aging. And specifically what we do is, well, the bottom line is we're trying to keep people out of nursing homes if at all possible. And you'll probably see the urgency of that as we go further on into the presentation. But the way we do it is to provide uh, various types of information and referral and specific types of services that are going to mean the difference between being able to age in place in the community um, and having to be institutionalized. So uh, the Area Agencies on Aging, um, as I said, are nationwide. We all function quite independently of one another. All of us receive certain kinds of funding from the federal and state governments. Um, but to find an area agency on aging here in Indiana, uh, there's a map. Um, this uh, link in the, in the center would take you to uh, a map of Indiana that has all the contact information for every area agency on aging in the state. And perhaps you are already familiar with yours. Um, if not, I strongly encourage you to do that because uh, to get in touch with these people and um, kind of get to know what they do, at least visit their website and so forth. That would really uh, put you far ahead of the game if, if you're not yet a caregiver. Um, and it would help you to help other people, um, library consumers and neighbors, whomever. Um, so if you want to find an area agency on aging in the uh, elsewhere in the country, let's say you have a loved one in Seattle or Pittsburgh or Tuscaloosa, you can go to eldercare.gov, type in a zip code or a city and state, and that will take you right to uh, some contact information for their area agency. Um, of course, you don't know why you're doing that yet, because we haven't yet talked about why that would be important to you. Um, to give you an example of the mission of the Area Agencies on Aging, um, I'm going to share SOCOA's um, mission statement. Now, SOCOA, um, I'm not allowed to tell you what it used to stand for, so I'm not going to tell you that it used to stand for Central Indiana Council on Aging. Okay, I didn't tell you that. Um, but uh, now it's just SOCOA. If somebody asks me what does SOCOA stand for, I say, well, we don't really know what JELLO stands for either. But, um, but we all know what JELLO is. So I'm going to tell you what SOCOA is. Then you'll have a good idea of what the area agencies on aging are and do. And our mission statement at SOCOA is to empower older adults, those of any age with a disability, and family caregivers to achieve the greatest possible independence, dignity, and quality of life. Now, you see the piece in there about uh, those of any age with a disability. We're talking about a physical disability and, uh, and their family caregivers. Now, if, if that is the case, then you can see what might have been the problem with a name like Central Indiana Council on Aging. Um, unfortunately, people are thinking when they hear the word aging, uh, that we would only serve those after a certain age. When in reality, as a case manager for SOCOA, I had a newborn at Riley Hospital waiting on services to be able to come home uh, so that the family could receive the support they needed to, to care for that baby. I had people of all ages on my caseload. And so that is why we really need to um, emphasize the, uh, the importance of, uh, of the older adults, those of any age with a disability, and their family caregivers. <clears throat> now, I'm going to talk a little bit about SOCOA departments uh, to give you an example of the kinds of things that may be available at your own local area agency on aging. As I said, we all function quite independently. We handle our money differently. You're going to find, uh, perhaps at your own agency, you may see services that SOCOA does not have. On the other hand, um, SOCOA being the largest area agency on aging in the state, um, we might have some things that yours does not have. 
And so the services vary uh, from agency to agency, but this is going to give you a good idea of uh, what is available. And then there are things in common, and I really want to stress those because they have to do with eligibility for personal uh, in-home help. And um, we'll get to that in just a bit. But first we'll start with SOCOA's Aging and Disability Resource Center. As far as I know, every area agency on aging in Indiana has an Aging and Disability Resource Center. Uh, we call them the ADRC. Um, SOCOA has 14 people who are on the phone answering questions all the time. And these people have a database of about 8,000 programs, services, and agencies in, uh, in uh, well, really, from, from central Indiana uh, to nationally that would help people who call with a question about aging or disability. Those same people on the phones do eligibility assessments for home and community-based care. And they also help people with applications for some of our other services. So this is a, a, a tremendous department, um, 14 people. And uh, in our agency, they receive between eight and 12,000 calls a month. So that's a lot of information they're giving out, kind of like librarians, I would say. So the Aging and Disability Resource Center um, have a great variety of services. Uh, my agency has a, a resource library. We offer unbiased Medicare counseling. Um, this is very important. We are trained certified SHIP counselors, and those people are able to help someone look at all of the platforms for possible uh, supplemental plans and drug plans and so forth and, and get an individual to a, a place where they can feel like they can make a decision about what to choose. And this is completely unbiased. Um, we are also the hub for receipt of information that may be uh, considered or suspected Medicare fraud. Um, this is something that is sponsored by Social Security and Medicare, uh, Senior Medicare Patrol. And um, when I'm talking to seniors and caregivers, I always urge them to please look at their statements from Medicare every month and make sure that um, the services that are reported and charged were indeed delivered to the consumer. Um, this is very important. So we collect this information. I had a gentleman call me one time from North Dakota, and he said, um, Ma'am, I'm calling to tell you that Medicare paid my $30,000 surgery bill. And since I usually receive uh, you know, some c kinds of calls that would be related to fraud, I, I wasn't sure why he was calling me. So I said, well, sir, um, that's wonderful that Medicare paid your $30,000 surgery bill. Why are you calling me? And he said, well, ma'am, I'm in North Dakota. I'm 86 years old, and I've never been in North Carolina in my life, and that's where the surgery happened. And so um, it really pays to, uh, to call us if there's some kind of uh, issue with Medicare statements. And obviously, that had been just a clerical error. I'm sure no one deliberately tried to charge Medicare $30,000 for surgery that did not happen, but um, perhaps his Social Security uh, number was confused or there was a transposed digit or something, but we need everybody to jump in and report suspected fraud or suspected error. This is so urgent for all of our population. So we also offer on-site workshops about keeping people safe and independent in the community, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. SOCOA has attorneys come on a monthly basis, and it's possible for our constituents to make an appointment to see them for, um, for a consult that costs nothing. So that's really great. Now, in terms of caregiver supports, um, my own agency is called CareAware. My department is called CareAware, and it operates on the belief that caregivers that everyone fits in the caregiver pie. So welcome to the caregiver pie, everybody. Um, you are today either a caregiver, a care recipient, or an onlooker. 
And we treat each of these pieces of the pie a little differently. We have direct supports for caregivers. We offer one-on-one -on -one counseling. Uh, that might be intermittent or it might be intensive. And um, you know, there are some people out there taking care of a person with, for example, Alzheimer's. And they are really very, very desperate for some, uh, some ongoing support that is going to help them to try and respond appropriately to bad behaviors or uh, difficulty with anxiety or agitation or what have you. So we work in terms of one-on-one -on -one counseling with our caregivers who need us. We also offer workshops for them. Um, again, we have a resource library. It's filled with brochures and books. And no matter where you are today, um, you may be able to benefit from a video series that is on our website. Uh, my website is www.cicoa.org. That's cicoa.org. And if you look for this icon that says CareAware, uh, Help and Hope for Family Caregivers, you can locate those videos, they are one half hour in length, and they are awesome. They are um, representing professionals who are some of Indiana's brightest and best physicians and attorneys and, and so forth, and caregivers besides. So, and they're, um, they're just, they're wonderful, and you can just look at one or you can look at all of them, but they're totally free, and you can get those right from our website. Then we also, uh, under the care, CareAware tab, you can look for my blog. I do a blog every month that uh, is really fun to do. I don't know how many people appreciate it, but it's, uh, it's a lot of fun for me to put together. So you can look for that also. We also believe that onlookers need to know about us. They need desperately to be familiar with the services because all of us are in a position to refer people to the Area Agencies on Aging and to support the, the caregivers. Um, and so we have workshops and trainings for employers, employees, clinicians, um, just a ton of different kinds of people. And I, I try to speak to the trustees every year at their annual meeting here in Indianapolis because if, you know, it has occurred to me that um, if every trustee in Indiana knew about the Area Agency on Aging and how to keep somebody in the home for at least one year, if they could just make the families aware of what services are available, it would possibly save Hoosiers about $66.5 million a year to just keep one person out of a nursing home per township. And that is a pretty striking uh, calculation. Um, yeah, there are 1,005 townships in Indiana, so I'm on a mission to educate township trustees, help them understand what's available. And if you know one of them, please make them aware of these services because it makes a difference. Um, and we'll talk about that a little further down the line, too. Um, we have um, pre uh, some preventative workshops also because I believe that seniors have an obligation to know how to best take care of themselves and really understand the value of doing so. Um, we can't really afford to just keep defaulting to nursing home anymore because somebody fell too many times for lack of grab bars in the bathroom. We have to be able to meet the growing uh, population of seniors. And so we have a workshop for them called Seniors Fighting Ageism. And uh, then we have a fall prevention program, Seniors in Balance, and a medication safety workshop for them, Seniors in Poison, just lots and lots of opportunities for seniors to be empowered uh, to do what they can to stay safe and healthy. <clears throat> Rosalind Carter, um, by the way, this is, uh, she's the one on the left, I'm on the right there, that's who, are, who is talking today. But um, Rosalind Carter uh, has said this many times and has been quoted uh, countless times, that there are only four kinds of people in the world, those who've been caregivers, those who are 
those who will be and those who will need the care. So um, I think that's pretty profound. I, I would add to that, however, though. I, I believe that uh, most of us are going to fit in more than one category. Most of us will be caregivers uh, if we're not already, and we might also eventually need the care. By the way, I don't know if you're aware of this, but caregivers are at higher risk statistically for uh, high, high blood pressure, coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, stroke, autoimmune disorders, and depression, to name just a few. And those, of course, all have their own complications. And if we uh, do not take care of our caregivers, if caregivers are not able to receive the help that they need or are not willing to receive the help that they need, then we're in a lot of trouble because caregiver burnout is the second leading indicator for early preventable premature nursing home admission. Um, so, and by the way, falling is the leading indicator. So we want to make sure we take care of our caregivers. So all of us are in the pie. Well, SOCOA, moving on to the other departments um, at my area agency on aging, um, SOCOA has a transportation service in Marion County, and we receive grant money that we subgrant to some of the outlying senior services agencies so that they can have their own transportation program. So um, great variety of options are available for uh, people uh, 60 and over. And um, actually, we are just about, I believe we are about to get a grant that will work with uh, people with physical disability also, which we've had in the past, and I think we are going to have again. But um, in any case, uh, we also have senior nutrition and wellness program, and the department at SOCOA is called Meals and More. Now, you've heard of Meals on Wheels, I'm sure. Um, Meals and More is not new. We have uh, just, I believe we've now celebrated our 19 millionth meal served. So about 3,000, 2,000 or 3,000 people have lunch with SOCOA every single day, uh, Monday through Friday. And um, these meals are typically uh, home delivered every couple of weeks uh, as frozen meals for people who are not able to get out of their homes or they are um, just going out for doctor appointment or church or something. They're not out roller skating on Friday nights, in other words. We also have neighborhood meal sites, and some of these are in the senior and uh, senior living complexes that where there may also be people with disabilities and so uh, the age limit doesn't apply in those neighborhood meal sites. Anyone who would like to have a meal can can go in. These are um, suggested donation only um, and it's based on income but a number of our clients are unable to contribute and uh, that's you know, that's not something that we uh, pursue because we don't want people going hungry. So, um, SOCOA also receives some interesting uh, opportunities to work with local hospitals. We have a voucher program so that people can go and purchase vouchers for the cafeteria at the hospital. Um, we have health education programs and farmers market vouchers. Kool-Aid is an interesting project. We receive a grant to purchase window air conditioners for people um, and fans and so forth in the summertime. And then we have a program called Safe at Home. And this is uh, both a single day annually and it is also an ongoing program. So we partner with other agencies and um, we work with uh, people who are unable to purchase a ramp, for example, if they own their own home and uh, can't afford a ramp, but now they need one, we can help them get one of those. And uh, the annual Safe at Home Day is very cool because we'll go in and blitz a whole neighborhood and, and work on safety. Uh, 
assessments in the home to determine what is needed here so that this person can remain in place and be safe. And it might be a banister to the basement because that's where the laundry is. Or it might be, you know, trimming back all the shrubs from the windows so that no one can hide in them and break in easily. Um, it's a, a variety of types of services like that. And here's an example of a lady who has lived in Marion County for a very long time, um, possibly spent her whole adult life in this uh, house, and um, now she's on a walker. And she's completely independent for, with all of her activities of daily living. She's still driving. She's still mentally acute. Uh, the only thing is she's a prisoner in her home because now she's on a walker. And you can just imagine, uh, based on that photo on the left, what would happen if she were to put that walker down on one of those steps. It's just kind of a catastrophe waiting to happen, right? So we uh, were able to get her these elongated steps. In this case, she did not need a ramp. She just needed uh, something that would bring the threshold from the door out a little further. And this cost her nothing, and now she's good to go. She doesn't have to worry about trying to juggle her walker and her keys and her groceries going up and down those stairs. And it's, uh, it's really a wonderful thing to see that. Now, this is something that is um, the same across the state. I'm going to cover the, uh, the part about the in-home services. Um, in terms of transportation, home delivered meals, neighborhood meal sites, and safe at home, those are all things that may be unique to your own agency or maybe you have something different from those things, So, depending on where you are. But uh, what I'm about to talk to you about now has to do with um, uh, something that is not unique to my agency. It is statewide. Uh, every agency has a staff of what are called care managers. And these people are most typically social workers. They visit clients quarterly to coordinate and monitor services that are home and community based. And these most often are, you know, they have to do with personal care. And we'll talk about what kinds of services those are. But we are not the home care agency. We coordinate and monitor those services and help people apply for funding that will cover the cost of those. So um, these are the uh, types of services that uh, may be managed by care managers. Well, care, manager, care management is itself a service, but um, the funding sources that we help people apply for may cover the cost of adult day service, personal care, home delivered meals, home and vehicle modifications, medical monitoring systems, medication management systems, um, and, uh, and then there's something called structured family caregiving where the family member can actually be the paid caregiver. Um, so let's just kind of delve into that just a little bit. Now, obviously, somebody could pay outright, privately, out of pocket for somebody to come in and help them with a bath, right? But maybe people, the person doesn't have money for that. Well, we help people apply for state funding that will cover that cost. So uh, the three uh, funding sources at the top numbered one, two, and three are the ones that the Area Agencies on Aging work with. The Medicaid Aged and Disabled Waiver is uh, by far the largest uh, number of consumers that we have. And then there's Choice Funding and the Medicaid Traumatic Brain Injury Waiver. Now, here's the thing. If you were to have to go to a nursing home, most likely, and I would say, uh, you know, a good percentage of people who go to a nursing home do not have the $6,700 to $12,000 a month it costs to plunk down for the nursing home care. And so most people, once they've depleted their resources and their uh, long-term care insurance, if they have it and all of that, are going to turn to Medicaid to cover the cost of nursing home. 
Well, for the state, is it is so much less expensive to keep people where they prefer to be anyway, which is usually in the home or with family or or in assisted living or those kinds of things. Uh, state is so much happier to help people try to do that, um, that they created these waivers. And think of the waiver as meaning in lieu of nursing home. Okay, if you go to a nursing home and Medicaid pays for it, that would be traditional Medicaid covering the cost of that. But if you're staying elsewhere, then you would go on the Medicaid Aged and Disabled Waiver. And waiver just means instead of nursing home, I'm going to stay put right where I prefer to be. And um, so that would be for people who are physically and financially eligible for uh, the Medicaid Aged and Disabled Waiver. Choice funding um, is a little easier to qualify financially. And then the Medicaid Traumatic Brain Injury Waiver, there are, I believe, only about 200 people in Indiana at this time. Now, please don't quote me on that, but it seems to me it's a much smaller number of people who need that particular waiver. And so, um, so we're going to focus our conversation for the next couple of minutes on just the Medicaid Aged and Disabled Waiver and choice funding. Um, and I've listed the other possible sources down at the bottom uh, for covering the cost of in-home care. And if I have time, I will cover a little bit about veterans' aid and attendance because that is really a very uh, critical piece also. Even though SOCOA and the Area Agencies on Aging do not uh, get involved in that, it's something very important for you to know. So let's move on to the uh, physical eligibility for uh, obtaining funding that would cover the cost of personal care. So um, these are the things that the state is looking at. Cognition, could somebody save himself in a fire? Can he or she take his medications without uh, getting confused? I had a lady on my caseload uh, when I was uh, in Tennessee, and uh, this lady took 50 pills for breakfast. Um, that's a lot of medication, and ironically, she had had a traumatic brain injury and was, um, you know, really very confused. So, how does somebody take care of those medications if they've got these issues to begin with? Um, feeding. If somebody has trouble with uh, getting the food from the plate to the mouth, now this is not meal preparation. It's just is this person a choke risk? Can they get the um, can they get the food uh, to the mouth? And can they swallow appropriately? Toileting tasks, of course, you know, maybe somebody just has trouble getting on and off the commode, or maybe they aren't able to get to the bathroom in time or whatever. And if somebody is falling, that would count. Um, unfortunately, in Indiana, you have to have fallen once to be considered a fall risk. But um, somebody who's having trouble with their mobility or transferring from one place to another, that would count. And then um, with dressing, of course, um, you know, this has nothing to do with fashion. So don't worry about flowers and plaids together or color clashes. Um, Indiana is, you know, not too picky about uh, how we dress. It's that we can dress safely. Are we wearing appropriate uh, shoes out in four below weather, or are we wearing flip-flops, or is it difficult to tie shoes, or whatever. And then bathing, of course. Is somebody safe to get in and out of a tub or shower? So to be eligible for the Medicaid Aged and Disabled Waiver, you have to need help with at least three of these. And then to, need, to be eligible for choice funding, you would need to require help with two of them. So three for waiver two for choice. Um, and um, what I usually say to people is, if somebody's on the fence, if you're not sure, call anyway. Always call. There may be some doubt. Um, and I realize that when you are talking to consumers of the library, you're not going to get into this much detail. But this is for you, for perhaps further down the road, or maybe for even right now. So these are just things that will help you understand your area agencies on aging. 
So this is the physical eligibility piece. Now let's look at the financial eligibility. In 2017, um, for a Medicaid waiver, aged and disabled uh, assets for a single person cannot exceed $2,000, and for a couple cannot exceed $3,000. That does not include a house and a car. Total monthly income cannot exceed $2,205 per month. Um, and you'll have access to this, as Karen announced. So if you want to go back and check, um, you can certainly do that. Um, but uh, I'll just finish here with choice funding. This is really the best kept secret in Indiana. It is unique to Indiana. And since you only need to require help with two uh, activities of daily living, and you can have up to $500,000 in assets, uh, including a house and a car, um, and the state will never touch those assets, um, that's a pretty cool deal. Um, now, there may be a slight cost share depending on monthly income, but it is very generous. And um, so it's really well worth it. And sometimes it is quite enough in terms of services to keep somebody safe for longer. Now, I would like to just... Uh, cover a couple of things having to do with some things outside of the area agencies on aging because these may come up at some point and it would be very helpful to you to know about them. If an attorney has to call me and ask about the Medicaid Aged and Disabled Waiver, that person is not an elder law attorney. <laughs> And I do get that happening from time to time. I'll, I've had someone uh, promote himself as an elder law attorney, and he called me all the time for his questions having to do with waiver. That guy is not an elder law attorney. And um, if there is any possibility that uh, there's any question about financial eligibility for the waiver or choice funding, um, always talk to a, a, an elder law attorney. And here's how to find a, one that is truly an elder law attorney. These people are certified. They, you know, have have done their homework and they know and they keep up on the changing laws and so forth. So there's NALA, which is a professional organization, N-A-E-L-A dot org. Uh, Indianapolis Bar Association will always do a lawyer referral service for you here in Indiana. They can give you some uh, some uh, people to start with. And then Senior Law Project is completely free to seniors who uh, cannot afford an attorney. And um, that is just remarkable. They have a staff of attorneys who really, they probably have the best knowledge there is in terms of Medicaid law and Medicare and so forth. Um, and probably I should not have said that, but because other attorneys are very good also. but. Um, you understand, I, I think, highly of this uh, not-for-profit organization, Senior Law Project. And then Indiana Legal Services, of course, for people with disabilities who are not seniors. Um, they offer free services to, uh, to Hoosiers for all sorts of things. And I see I do have a couple of minutes to talk about veterans' aid and attendance. And this is very important. Um, and I can speak from personal knowledge because my own mother-in-law was on that particular funding source. And um, it's an awesome thing if you have not had any kind of exposure to this. Um, and I'll just tell you what I know about the criteria and keep in mind that um, you know I have no control over whether they change the rules at some point down the right, down the pike or, or not. But, um, but for now, I know that this applies to any veteran or his widow or his spouse who was honorably discharged, who was in the military for a minimum of 90 days with at least one day being during wartime. Um, and if it is possible to prove that the individual's medically necessary living expenses exceed the monthly income, uh, that person may be eligible for veterans' aid and attendance. And that is a cash payment on a monthly basis 
Um, I can't give you exact numbers, but I believe my own mother-in-law received that cash payment for about six and a half years. And uh, it seems to me it was, for her, it was about $1,200 a month. And this went right into her checking account, and uh, her guardian was able to use that to help pay her assisted living bill every month. And um, it can, but it can be used for any kind of medically necessary living expense. So, um, and I believe that one of the other criteria was that uh, the person cannot have more than eighty thousand dollars in cash savings. But um, please don't take my word for all of that. Contact your own local. Uh, it would be the county. Veteran service officer, if you have a veteran in your family who might possibly qualify, or a spouse, or widow, or widower. Um, but the reason I bring it up is that it is so easy to find the veteran service officer. And um, unfortunately, there are some pretty unscrupulous home care agencies out there that will. Um, kind of use some unusual tactics that I think are unethical. I had a, um, a caregiver call me at one point and she said that her parents had been uh, guests at one of those luncheons that was provided by some kind of agency. And uh, the person presenting said, well, we want to help you apply for aid and attendance. And it is so hard to do and it takes so long. And, but when the VA sees our company name at the top of your application, they push it right through. So um, uh, outside, agencies are not al allowed to charge money for helping to apply for this. But um, they're very likely to, um, to try and uh, be the provider of care. And in, in this particular case, when I had the caregiver calling me saying her parents had attended this luncheon, um, her parents actually had signed a contract saying that they would use that agency. And of course, then a plan of care gets written that is possibly even inappropriate for the couple. And they're spending all that money. And I've had other another caregiver call me who said that his, uh, his family member had actually signed the check over to the home care agency. And um, so I just would like you to be kind of alert to these kinds of things and always contact the veteran service officer because they have the most knowledge with regard to the VA anyway. So um, I think that's probably all I want uh, to say about that. But uh, this guy on the slide, Matt Hall, he's only for Marion County. So you would want to click on the link to uh, the, the map of Indiana and then click on your own county to find your veteran service officer. And the types of services that you can get with that, as I said, are assisted living or, or um, actually help with home care. Um, you can use that money for premiums for your medications or co-pays for your doctor visits, whatever is going to be medically necessary, and including uh, possibly even uh, the uh, durable medical equipment. If you are trying to find a nursing home for your loved one, now we know that sometimes a nursing home is going to be inevitable. It's going to be the safest, most humane, uh, plan of care for some individuals. And so if you have had to place your loved one in a nursing facility or it's looking like that's going to be necessary, we understand that. Um, and we, we know that sometimes that is just the best route for all concerned and uh, especially for the individual having to go there. But um, if you are looking for a nursing facility, please consider going uh, to Nursing Home Compare, which is a Medicare site. It's a .gov. And um, you can search by zip code and compare. I mean, if you put in your zip code, you'll get every nursing facility within a radius of, of where you are. And then you can pick three at a time and compare them on a variety of uh, things. 
um, and they've been raided. So, you know, it, it is helpful to kind of see what's going on. And you can also see complaints and things if there are any. If you need to report a, uh, a situation that uh, would you know, warrant checking out. Um, you have some options here, and so I would really encourage you to to pursue the ombudsman or the Indiana Attorney General, and um, those are always available to you. And um, and that I would just uh, tell you not to hesitate to to make a complaint or ask a question or what have you. They are they're good people trying to help us. There's some additional free resources that might help uh, quite a bit. The www.benefitscheckup.org, I'm sorry, benefitscheckup.org uh, is for anybody, not for just aging or disabled or, you know, whatever. Uh, you, can, you can go to that website and put in a bunch of personal information. It is um, it, it's a totally secure site and uh, just put your stuff in and it will tell you um, things that your loved one or you yourself may be eligible for. It's a great thing to, to check out. So, and of course, the, the results may change from time to time. Um, so keep checking. Um, Joy's House Care Kit is a really cool uh, three ring binder where you can record everything. If you are the caregiver, uh, you can actually fill this out and just leave it in the house of the loved one so that if something happened to you and a perfect stranger had to walk in and uh, take care of your loved one for a day or a month or whatever, that person knows where to start, how to, you know, what to do, where to go, who to call, who the doctor is, when to give the medications, when to water the plants, what temperature your loved one likes the house to be. It's a very wonderful Three ring binder, it is free. I believe you need to pick it up. Um, and it is, uh, it's actually here in Indiana at Joy's House, which is an adult day service locally. Um, and that is kind of on 62nd Street, uh, right across from Glendale Mall, if you uh, happen to be in the area. Um, but go to the website uh, for Joy's House and just see what they have there and, and perhaps they would even ship it to you if you offer, in fact, I know they would ship it to you if you offered to pay for shipping and it wouldn't be expensive to do. And then, of course, we've got the Alzheimer's Association. They are just um, amazing in terms of helping folks uh, and they have this hotline, which is listed here. The hotline is uh, a great opportunity because not everything happens at two o'clock in the afternoon. Very often uh, things happen at two in the morning and um, sometimes you just need that voice on the other end helping you uh, get through and navigate some of the behaviors that you have to deal with in Alzheimer's. And AARP of Indiana also has uh, quite a bit going on in terms of caregiving right now and that uh, lots of lots of opportunity to learn from them as well. So, just very quickly, you may have heard of two one one Connect to Help. These are uh, people who offer lots of information, but often when it has to do, if you have a question related to aging and disability, they are going to send you to your local area agency on aging. So. Um, you wouldn't need to call them for information that's related to aging and disability. You would want to call your own area agency. Adult Protective Services is for somebody in imminent danger. Um, somebody who's physically or mentally incapacitated and reported as abused, neglected, or ex exploited. By the way, did you know that it's estimated that about 50% of people with Alzheimer's in, uh, in this country are uh, abused in some way. Um, so no doubt all of us know somebody, we just aren't aware that, that that's happening. So, uh, but Adult Protective Services, imminent danger. And then the local area agency on aging, and again, you would check that out at eldercare.gov or at the link given earlier 
with the map of Indiana. And this is for information, referral, and tangible forms of assistance for independence for anyone of any age with a disability. And this is long-term and for the duration of need. And um, this, I need to specify, you know, the services are for the duration of need. If somebody, an elder who happens to be on Medicare, goes to the hospital, then goes to rehab, then comes home with a little bit of rehab, that is a window that's going to end. But the local area agencies on aging, which would be through the Medicaid Aged and Disabled Waiver or Choice Funding or the Traumatic Brain Injury Waiver, those are going to be for how long the person needs. So this really matters because most of us are going to be caregivers and caregivers together contribute about $522 billion a year to the U.S. economy in uncompensated time and services. So you can see what would happen if we had to replace these people because they burned out, um, you know, or if we suddenly had to just start putting everybody in a nursing facility who needed help with a few things. Um, and here's the comparison, which is really pretty awesome. Um, average monthly cost in Indiana for nursing home care, that's no frills, double occupancy is going to run about $7,000 a month. But if somebody goes on the waiver or choice, you can see the difference here. And you can see why it is so critical um, economically that we do this. But, you know, it's not just about the economics for the caregiver and the care recipient and taxpayers, it is also about quality of life for all of us. So even though we know that sometimes nursing facility is going to be the best form of care for somebody, nobody should have to go there just because they didn't know about the Area Agency on Aging and what services might be available to them. So what you can do, um, get to know us become familiar with our services, and you've just done that, thank you so much, and share our information socially, professionally. Be alert to the needs of people around you. I find people in the supermarkets and in my church lobby, foyer, and uh, all over the place. I just, I find people no matter where I go and kind of suggest they might want to call Sokoa. So, but, and finally, don't, uh, don't neglect to call us and just ask about services that might be available for your own loved one if help is needed. So if we increase public awareness, we're going to reduce preventable injuries, 911 emergencies and non-emergencies. We're going to uh, prevent some risks for abuse and um, hospital readmissions, unnecessary and premature nursing home admissions, and that's going to improve quality of life for you and for me. So independence, dignity, and quality of life, I thank you so much, and I just wonder if uh, there might be any questions, Karen. There is a question about why would they call SOCOA instead of the Alzheimer's Association? Uh, well, the Area Agency on Aging and the Alzheimer's Association complement one another very much. Um, Alzheimer's Association will very often tell people to call the Area Agency on Aging because the Alzheimer's Association does not help people apply for state funding. Um, if somebody needs basic information about managing behaviors, or how to respond in a certain situation, Alzheimer's Association has a wonderful uh, support system that way. And uh, they have trained social workers who really know a lot about Alzheimer's disease. SOCOA uh, and the Area Agencies on Aging also have that. But in addition, we are the ones who are going to be helping people to apply for state funding that's going to perhaps buy some respite for that caregiver. <clears throat> um, Alzheimer's Association does not do that. So hopefully that uh, makes sense. You would use both organizations, hopefully. All right, we're going to wait a few minutes if there are other questions. Ah, here's a question. Are there waiting lists for the aged waiver or choice? 
Well, I am very happy to respond to that. Um, several years ago, when I was a phone options counselor, there was a two-year wait list for the Medicaid Aged and Disabled Waiver. And it was the most heartbreaking thing to have a caregiver, you know, to have them call and say, well, you know, my mother's coming home from the hospital. She can't even walk and what to do. And that, well, we'll call you in a couple of years. You know, that would be my response at that time. Um, so, but now, um, actually, here's the way it works. Uh, you call the Area Agency on Aging. You have a telephone eligibility assessment. And within 10 days, someone needs to come to the home or wherever the loved one is and meet with the loved one and the family member and complete the paperwork and the plan of care and then all of that gets sent to the state. And the state right now, as far as I know, is only taking uh, probably, I would, I would give them two, maybe eight weeks to get back. But very often, it's a lot sooner. And uh, because, and now switching to choice funding, I will say uh, that uh, there used to be a much longer wait list for choice funding because more people can qualify they only need two activities of daily living, and they can have much more in assets. But now there's no wait list for choice either. And um, so that's going very quickly as well. Now with choice, do you have to go to the state with uh, an application, or is that just locally with the aging agency? Um, well, all of it goes, uh, both the waiver and choice funding are handled through the Area Agency on Aging. So you would first make the phone call and say, I'd like to have an eligibility assessment for in-home assistance. And uh, the person on the phone is going to take a lot of information. It takes about a half an hour over the phone. And uh, that person is going to figure out what somebody may be eligible for. And um, so all of that happens at the local level with the Area Agency on Aging. And then they turn it over to a field options counselor who makes a home visit. And then it is given to the state. And the state comes back to the agency. And it's all coordinated out of the agency. Well, I don't see any more questions. We thank you for you know attending today. We really appreciate it. And I will get those uh, LEUs out to you and let you know at that same time the link to the archived uh, version of today's presentation.